your word come and saturate our, our thinking, but Father, to touch our hearts, um, that we would be alive by the power in the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So last week we left with uh, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and that Jesus is alive. We had the testimony of the empty tomb and of the women and of the angels, but they went back to the disciples and the disciples said, uh-uh, we don't believe. They are the greatest skeptics that we see in scripture over and over. Jesus talks about how the disciples themselves were slow to believe and in fact it didn't believe right after the resurrection. And we left the passage in Luke chapter 24 with them wondering and not knowing what was going to happen. So in Luke chapter 24, we're going to begin at verse 13, this story as Jesus finds is walking beside two disciples and they find Jesus there with them, only they're not aware. And it may be like some of you and me today, uh, where the Lord Jesus is with us and he is working, but it's not till after the fact that our eyes are really opened and he is revealed. So let's look at this amazing story, Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. And they were kept from recognizing him. And so he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces were downcast, And one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and you do not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, Jesus asked. Don't you like Jesus' sense of humor? I mean, they're talking about him, right? What things, he asked. Oh, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped, the saddest words anyone can say, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us and they went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. And they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive And then some of our companions, they went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks and he broke it and he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem where they, were, where they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord is risen. We reply, no, no, no. He, I say the Lord is risen, and you say he is risen indeed. Okay, I'll try it again. Okay, it's true. The Lord is risen. He is risen and he appeared to Simon. And then the two got their turn, and they told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. We have this amazing story of two disciples 
who knew Jesus well, had walked with him, but their hearts were totally crushed. And the hope had dissipated from where they were. We've had a really violent week here in our neighborhood in, in Honolulu. And we've seen situations where people's hearts have just been crushed and the hope just snuffed away. And it was like that with these two disciples. As they were walking, their hearts were heavy, they were sad, and they were talking, trying to make some sort of sense over all the things that they had seen and experienced. But in the process, we find something that's true for every single believer. Uh, but before we do that, I want to read Luke 24, verse 32. Can we read this together? Oh, it's not up there, so that's okay. I'll read it and you repeat it, okay? We're not our hearts burning. Okay, let's try it together. We're not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us. Amazing story of an experience they still didn't know was Jesus, but just the very presence of Jesus and this dialogue with this stranger started something happening, a burning in their hearts. If you have your, your sermon notes, you want to follow with me. Um, the secret truth for every person in the world. And the first thing is that Jesus is walking with us as a hidden companion. That Jesus is walking right there as a hidden companion companion. Why would Jesus want to go with you wherever you go, sit beside you in church and, and be with you in the car when you go home? Why? What is going on in the heart of God? It, it's something like uh, what happened. Ben, ben and I, we were washing our cars and waxing them yesterday and, um, and trying, to, trying to make them spiffy. And we, we decided to call my son, Ben, on the phone in New York. And it was just really great. He picked up the phone Kids, you have no idea how much joy you give when you pick up the phone and you talk to your parents. And, and it was just a way of being together with him. And, and Ben and Ben and I, we, we talked and we talked story the whole time. And it wasn't important in terms of what we were talking about so much as we were just being together. Why we love each other. And when you love each other, you want to be together. The Lord loves you so much. Not only did he die for you on the cross so that you can be forgiven and you can walk in a new life, but he loves you enough to actually want to be with you all the time. All the time. The Lord Jesus wants to be with you and is with you through the presence of his spirit, very literally. And here we see this, the two disciples walking and Jesus is walking with them, only they don't realize it's Jesus. He is hidden from their eyes. The psalmist said something like this, where can I go from your presence, God? Where can I flee? If I go to the farthest corners of the earth, there you will be with me. If I go all the way up into the stars, there you will be with me. If I'm a, a Navy diver and I go down and I'm underneath the ocean, even there, God, you are with me. And we see this here. The secret truth of every person is that whether you know him or not, whether you're aware of him or not, Jesus is walking with us as a hidden companion. Now, this is, is terrifying if you're trying to hide from God. It's terrifying if what's coming out of your mouth is not honoring to Jesus. It's terrifying if what you are doing in your body is not something that you want Jesus to be doing with you. But it is glorious. It is glorious. If you're asking for help, if you need for forgiveness, it's glorious if you're lonely and you need courage, you need strength. It's glorious if you are saying, Lord, just fill me with your love. It is glorious when you approach and invite him in your heart. Secret of every, every person. Believer, unbeliever, atheist, non-atheist, we see it all through scripture. Jesus is right there. But there's a second secret that's true for you and it's true for me because we're the same in this in that there is a torch inside each one of us that is waiting to be lit. There is literally a torch. And again, um, I like to 
to do demonstrations and I was going to do it and I said, nah, people are going to give me trouble again because they give me trouble. I was going to bring my blowtorch, all right, and I was going to get the acetylene and I was going to, and I was going to fire that baby up. There is a torch inside of each one of us that God has put in your heart, but it can only be ignited by the person and the presence of the Lord Jesus through his spirit. And God has made you and he's made me with a heart in his image. That means a heart made to have a relationship with him. But more than that, a heart that when we are lined up with the heart of God and the desire of God, and we're walking with him, that there is a passion in our heart, just like a torch that is ignited to live for him and to burn for him. And, and Bart, thank you for sharing. Uh, uh, what would take someone all the way to China to serve? And there is a, a, a torch that is ignited inside us when the Holy Spirit touches, and it's, it's the work of Jesus. So, the secret truth for each of us, you see that in verse 15 and 16 of, of this passage, as they're walking along, Jesus himself came up and walked with them. Isn't it fun? Jesus kind of just worms his way in there, but they were kept from recognizing him. And then Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, this, this is really interesting because they're walking. They have seven miles to go, seven-mile trip, and they're walking. And all of a sudden, Cleopas and the other one, they just stop. And they look at Jesus. He said, are you serious? Are you the only person in all of Jerusalem that has no idea what's been going on? What else is there to talk about? Duh! You know, Jerusalem at the Passover had a million people in it. Everyone from nations came. It was the biggest festival that happened. And, and it was with Jesus front page news. Every street you walk down, every alley, every marketplace you went, they were talking about Jesus. That Jesus the prophet had come to Jerusalem and that he was handed over by the leaders so all the rulers knew him, handed over to the Roman rulers, the governor knew him, everyone else knew him, and everyone was talking about him everywhere because they nailed him to a cross. How can you not know? Can you imagine someone in time travel? They, they haven't been around for the last year and they, and they come and they say, what are you guys doing wearing masks? What are you doing having screens? What are you doing all sitting apart? I mean, normally we'd have 300 people crammed in here. What's going on here? What's all this craziness? And you would say, duh, where have you been? You're the only one that doesn't know we've got a virus and some pandemic going on. When you're talking about evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is indisputable that Jesus walked this earth, that he was Jesus of Nazareth, know where he's from. Indisputable that he was in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover, that he was handed over by the religious leaders, that he was crucified by the Romans on a Roman cross. Indisputable, and that the whole city knew about it. That's why we have more record of this event than any other event in history. Everybody knew about it. <laughs> when Jesus is playing the dummy, <laughs> he said, oh, really? Tell me about it. It's kind of fun when you can listen in to people talking about you. And Jesus does it all the time with you and with me. And he still loves us. And he still walks with us. Very interesting. When we look at evidences for the resurrection, these are the things that they gave as unbelievers at this point as to what had happened. And there are things that I've already made reference to briefly. Verse 19, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied he was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed. Again, all the documents, whether in scripture or outside of scripture, say that he was a miracle worker. And he had a supernatural power going on in his life. The chief priests, so the very highest in the, in the Jewish community knew him. 
and all the rulers also knew of him. This was nothing that was done in a corner, in a secret little dark place, that afterward people fabricated some story that Jesus was somehow a guy who showed up. This was frontline news. Everybody was aware of it. And then it goes from there. Not only that, they handed him over to be sentenced by death. That was done publicly. And then they crucified him publicly. Thank you, Lord, for dying for us. And then you have this, but we had hoped. You know, the, the scripture that, that Crystal read this morning, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, we are most of all people to be pitied. Because there is no hope. There is no forgiveness if Jesus didn't rise again from the grave. There is no chance for any mistake that you have made to ever be repaired or forgiven. There's no chance for anything that separates you from your parents or from your kids and your family to ever be healed unless Jesus rose again from the grave. We're just stuck with our failure and our sin and the best effort we can do. And so the Bible says, if that's all there is, then you just pity all the believers. But it says, in fact, he is risen. Because Christ is alive. And now everything is transformed. And so they give all these evidences between verse 19 through to 24. It talks about, again... The third day afterwards, since all this took place, in verse 22, some of the women went. In fact, uh, one of the men, uh, Cleopas, might have been the husband of Mary who went before the, the cross. Because it says in, in John 19 that Mary, the wife of Clopas, was the same person, we don't know. And the women went... And they amazed them, and they give testimony to the tomb, and they didn't find his body. And then, verse 23, they came and told us what they had seen, a vision of angels, testimony of the angels. And then, the angels said that he was alive. And then, some of the men, the apostles went, they went to the tomb, found it, just as the woman had said. But him, Jesus, didn't see it. Some of you may be there right now. There's lots of evidence. I haven't seen Jesus yet. Jesus, where are you? We hear all these testimonies from people who stand up here and the elders stand up, and, but that's fine for you, but I haven't seen Jesus yet. The answer to our blindness of his presence. Why is it, Jesus, that you stay hidden? Hey, Jonathan, you, you say that he's always there. I just don't, I'm not aware of it. Why is it he doesn't reveal himself to me more? Why, doesn't, why is he hidden so much? And I want to give you a couple of answers to our blindness of his presence. It's not that God is blind. It's that we don't recognize his presence. And when Jesus jumps into this conversation, um, he comes... Because he doesn't have anything to prove. He is alive. He doesn't have to prove himself to you or to me about who he is or what he's done. But in his love of wanting a relationship with us, he comes. And first of all, we need the word to fuel our minds about Christ. Can we say word? The word. By the word, we need scriptures. We need the scriptures... Because just like this torch inside us, when the scriptures are read and when they are taught and when they are understood, it is like a fuel inside that of, of our being that the Holy Spirit can then ignite and bring us to life. And what Jesus does is they, they tell him all this and then he says in verse 25, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have, have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Some people think that unbelief is rooted in convincing the mind. I would challenge you on that. Hey, it's important that we ask questions. Our nine o'clock service, we had all kinds of questions and people do them great. We need to engage the mind because the resurrection of Jesus is based on evidence and of a historical situation and our walking with Jesus now is based on evidence, okay? But 
The obstacles to faith are not primarily in our mind, it's in your heart. Because we're slow in our hearts. Because our hearts have been hurt, our hearts have been let down, we have hoped, <laughs> and it didn't turn out the way we thought it would, and we are so afraid in our hearts that if we trust in this Jesus and he turns out not to be true, what is going to happen to me? And I could never handle the heartbreak. Most of our resistance in obeying Jesus is that we are slow of heart because we're very cautious. And oh, the, the joy we forfeit. So we need the word because the word speaks truth to our minds and fuel to our minds. But it needs to be ignited in our hearts by the Spirit of God. And Jesus goes through with them, oh, what a glorious seven miles that would have been. And he goes through all of the scriptures, beginning with Moses, that includes Genesis, Exodus to Deuteronomy, and then all the prophets, all the Old Testament. He walks through with them as to how they all pointed to himself. They still didn't know it was Jesus. And he goes through, and, and uh, every single passage in the Bible ultimately points to Christ. And it points to him as the fulfillment. So all the stories in the Old Testament, you say, why is that story there? Because it's pointing you to Christ. Why is, that, why is the law there? Christ is the heart of the law that God has given. He's the economy of Israel. Why are all those rituals there? They're pointing to something deeper in Christ. And so we see in Genesis, he is the seed of the woman. We see in Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. We see in Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's the cloud and he's the fire. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet, the, the one that was coming after Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's, he's the judge and the lawgiver. In Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer. Do you understand all of these parts of the Old Testament? So listen, when you read your Bible... Jesus is trying to get your attention in your mind to understand who he is. And so at the beginning of reading your Bible, talk to him and say, Jesus, I need you to speak to me the truth so I can understand who you are. Three questions when you read your Bible. One, what's it saying about God? And what's it saying about Jesus? Why? That's why I'm reading it. But number two, what's it saying about me? Jesus, I'm in here somewhere. I mean, if I put myself in this passage, I'm one of those two guys walking along with my head down who's not finding joy in the day because of the stuff that has just happened around us. And I've got to get my heart and my mind refocused on Christ. Okay? And then so what? Is there something you're wanting to do in me or through me or, or around me, Jesus, by the truth of what I'm learning? So this, this fuel of Scripture, I could go through every passage of the Bible in the Old Testament and say, hey, it points to Jesus. So we need the Word to fuel our minds, but we need the Spirit to ignite our hearts in burning hope. You can read the Scriptures till you're blue in the face if you read them without seeking a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Scriptures come alive when you invite the Holy Spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit. You invite the Spirit of God in worship. And the scriptures come alive because it's Jesus reading to you. Husbands, do you read scripture to your wives? Parents, do you read scriptures to your kids? Wives, do you read scriptures to your husbands? You know, it is powerful when you take the word of God and you invite the spirit of God to now reveal Jesus to you. Very, very powerful. Don't underestimate and it will be more difficult than you think. And you say, why is that difficult? Because all the things of the enemy and of the flesh will try to stop you from doing two things, from reading scripture together and from praying together. And that's why it's so difficult. But Jesus is greater. He's risen from the dead and he is here to help us and he is here to lead us. So the answer to our blindness 
is number one, the scriptures open up our eyes as they bring fuel to our minds about Christ, but then we need the Spirit of God to ignite our hearts with a burning hope. In Revelation uh, chapter 4, you have this picture of the throne of God, and around the throne you have the elders, and coming from the throne you have lightning coming out. Now, do you think, um, you, you know, when you, when you try to start a torch, you, you get a flint and you get a spark? All right, whoosh. Do you think God has enough life and enough electricity to light your heart on fire? Do you think so? It says he's got lightning bolts coming from his throne. You want to light the blowtorch? He doesn't have a little flint spark. He's got a lightning bolt, okay? Okay, John and the Steeper, you're pretty dead. Zappo! Let's get this heart going here, okay? But more than that, it talks about there are flaming, burning torches around the throne, which represent the seven spirits of God. And the Spirit of God wants to come and bear testimony to the spirit that he has placed inside you in his image. That's why you're made with a torch and ignite you to be who he's called you to be in Jesus Christ. He wants to do that in your relationships, in your marriage. He wants to do that in your children. But it takes the spirit of God that to ignite and to change us and transform us. Um, in this passage... We have them walking along, Jesus is walking, and their hearts are burning inside them. Something is going on. They still don't know it's Jesus, and it's dark, and they get to their home, and Jesus pretends like he's going to go for it further, and, and they say, no, come on in. It's not safe for you to keep going. Come in and be with us. This is a good, if you're in Ohana group, listen up. And they say, have you ever invited anyone to come to your home? <laughs> and they say, no. You know, don't expect them to come in the first invite. Even Jesus didn't come in the first invite. Okay? They invited him again. And he said no. He was going to go further. Why? He's testing the resolve of whether their invitation is genuine. He's testing the resolve of what, of, of, of what is in their heart. And it says that the, the verbiage is almost violent. It says they compelled him to come in with them. Because so much did they want this man who they didn't know was Jesus, it was Jesus, to come into their home. And so Jesus goes into their home, and then they just have a normal time around a meal. Some of you are, are asking for the Lord to reveal himself to you. Some of you have said, why does he do all these things in other people's lives, but in my life, I haven't experienced Jesus that way? Well, Jesus will reveal yourself himself to you very differently from me or the person beside you or anyone else. In all these resurrection accounts, it's different. No one else had it like these two in the road to Emmaus. No one else had it like the women when they went to the tomb. No one else had it like Peter when Jesus met with him by the lake. No one else had it like Thomas where he said, put your hand in here. It'll be different for every one of you. And usually it will be at a normal, mundane time when you least expect it. They were just sitting down to have a meal. Why, why are we so convinced about Ohana groups and meeting together as God's people in our homes? Because that's often where Jesus reveals himself. They're just having a meal. But it's in those times... You know, it may be you're just sitting down for another boring sermon and another Sunday. But it's on that Sunday when God breaks through and your life has changed forever. It's on that Sunday when you realize a truth and you experience forgiveness, maybe in a way and in a relationship you've never known before. Don't underestimate the boring, mundane times. They have, have a meal. What happened? Jesus, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he handed it out. Now, what's strange about that? Well, everything was flipped, because normally, if you're in a Near Eastern home, uh, it would be the dad who would take the loaf of bread, and he would break it, and he would give it to all the family members. And Jesus was the stranger, and yet he stepped in with authority, and he took the bread. We don't know what made their eyes open up to understand it was Jesus. Maybe it was this, this role of, of, of taking the role of being the host. Maybe it was the blessing that, that he said over, over the, the meal. 
Maybe it was when he handed them out, they saw his hands. We don't know. But something happened that changed those disciples' lives forever. Because they knew that Jesus' resurrection was just not some nice, wishful idea. But he was alive. And now everything in their life and everything in their future was changed. So much so, right away, oh, Jesus has a great sense of humor. I mean, here, waiting for him to reveal, see, he is alive. They finally say, hey, it's Jesus, and he's, they're eating, and what happens? What does Jesus do? Whoop, he's gone. <laughs> he's hidden again. Why, Jesus? You ever want him to show himself a lot more than he does? <laughs> Why, Jesus? Because he wants the flame in our heart to learn, to burn, not by what we see in our outside situations, but that we burn by a faith in the word that he has given us and in the power of his presence. And so they get up and they, they actually go the seven miles in the dark back to Jerusalem. No street lights in those days. And, and they go back to Jerusalem and they find the eleven. They get into the upper room and there they don't even get a chance to say anything to anybody about their amazing experience because the 11 are all telling them hey Jesus is risen it's true he's alive he's risen and he even appeared to Peter then finally they get to put their two cents in you know what and he appeared to us too when we were having a meal he took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and all of a sudden we knew it was Jesus. When you invite Jesus, whether that's in your devotional time or whether it's coming to worship or whether it's in your family, when you invite Jesus to stay, he's with you. <laughs> he's there with you, but you need to invite him. That's our part. And when you invite him in, a couple of things happen. One, he energizes us to run back into the places of fear. Instead of heartbreak, our hearts are, are healed and, and transformed. And if you want to make a sick joke, you say heartburn. <laughs> okay, their hearts burned within them. In, instead of, 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 of coping and trying just to get through it, there was this hope that was stirred in their heart about the reality of Jesus. Instead of retreating and running away, there was a returning back to the place where they were hunting them to kill them. I got a, a call from one of my friends and, and they are just beside themselves because uh, this friend in Canada there is a church and the government built a fence around the church so that people could no longer go to church. That's the kind of thing you hear about in, to, in Iran. That's the kind of thing you would hear about in North Korea, not in a democratic free world of free religion. And they are locked out by a fence. Now, I, I know farming communities, and I can just imagine some of those farmers, they're going to pull out those massive four-wheel drive tractors and hook on. I don't know if they'll pull them down or what they'll do. But we find that these two disciples ran back into the community. And if there's ever a time we come to Kaliyun in church and there are tanks outside and there's a fence saying, you cannot worship here. You know that the torch that we have, it comes first and foremost from the Spirit of God and we run into the community, not away from it. And we go into the community with the power of Jesus. These disciples, why do we know Jesus was alive? The whole city knew about the crucifixion. The, and the whole city knew that any disciple, there was a price on his head and a death sentence on them. And these men ran back into the middle of all of the fear and the turmoil. And they started proclaiming that Jesus was alive. And they did it, and they did it, and they did it. And they were tortured, and they went and they proclaimed to the furthest nation, even at the cost of their very lives. Oh boy. When Jesus reveals himself, you listen. <laughs> because the 
heartburn, the burning of your heart, the identity of who you are, of why you are alive on this earth, all of a sudden, all of a sudden comes to fruition. And you are who you were made to be under Christ. When you invite Jesus to stay, he energizes us to run back into the places of fear. He stirs us to seek out the fellowship of other believers. You know, one of the great things about COVID, um, one of the horribly great things about COVID is the separation that it has caused culturally among people. And why do we encourage people to meet in homes and in Ohana groups? Because we need touch. You know that without touch, you die. You need hugs, you need kisses. It's, it's a fundamental factor of health. But more than that, of our spiritual well-being. And everything in the world and of sin separates people. And you will see this more and more. Separation. Everything of God and Christ brings people together. Always. And it's a real crisis for some people. It's a real crisis for some people. Because the world's trying to pull apart and God's pulling together. Which way are you going to go? You're going to be ripped in two? And the things of Jesus will always bring you together with other believers. Always. Whatever the danger is on the outside, the Spirit of God is saying, hey, Jesus is alive. And Jesus is bigger than death. And Jesus is bigger than fear. And they ran. And whenever we say, invite Jesus to stay, we seek out the fellowship of other believers. And then he speaks through us this wonderful news of life. That's what he does. So I want to pray. And this is the fun part. I want to pray that the Lord will reveal himself to us. You do that? And some of you are, are, are just asking, hey, Lord, I need to see you. I, I, I believe you're walking with me, but I just haven't seen you. God, would you reveal yourself? So let's stand. I'm going to ask him to do that right now in us. And, and uh, it will be specific for you. I don't know when he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to do it. But we're going to ask that he will do it, that out of his love. But you have to ask him. To reveal himself. And some of you, um, young people and youth that are, that are here, um, you've heard stories of adults and other people of how Jesus has ministered. I'm going to ask that the Lord Jesus will reveal himself specifically to you in a very unique way. Some of you have been church long times. You've heard stories from missionaries, but you're saying, God, why don't you do that here? Yeah, I'm going to ask him to reveal himself to you. Okay? And me. I'm in there too. Let's pray. Father, right now we come. You are the God who is always with us. And Lord, you, you love to walk with us because you love us. And you're more interested in our lives even than we are. And Father, right now I pray that you will bring not only evidence of your presence with us, but Father, that you will reveal yourself to us. Lord, I pray very, very specific way. You know how to do it, God. In a way that is completely unique. It may be in the middle of the night when someone's sleeping. It may be, Lord, in, the, in a car. It may be in a quiet time with their Bible open, Lord. It, it may be that we, our eyes are open to see something we haven't seen before. And you are just saying, hey, I'm right here. But I pray, God, that you will do that for each person here. And, Lord, that our eyes would be opened. And that our hearts would be ignited. Father, that there would be that burning torch within us. Lord, because you are alive. And you are leading and directing our lives. So we thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I'm going to ask you to think of someone else. And pray that God would reveal himself to them right now. Okay? And remember, Jesus is right there with whoever we're praying for. They may be around the world, but he is right there. So right now we're going to pray that the Lord Jesus stirs their heart. Okay? So Jesus, in your name right now, we pray for someone else, Lord. The person you put on a heart. God, that like those two men, you're walking with whoever we love and whoever we're praying for, God. 
But like those two men, Lord, that it, there'd be something that would reveal the reality that you are with them right now and the reality of your love and the power of your salvation and of the truth of your forgiveness. So Lord, we pray this right now, whoever we're praying for, wherever they are, God, that you would reveal very specifically and individually to them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Throne of grace for grace is making.